Good afternoon. Uh, I'm one of your panelists, uh, Dr. Tim Hess. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Uh, we look forward to a wonderful lecture from Dr. Ralph Schuler coming up here. Uh, we're going to spend just a little bit of time letting everybody get logged in to their Zoom accounts and getting this figured out. Um, while we're doing that, just some housekeeping. I want to thank all our sponsors today. Our sponsors include the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics, Comet USA, University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Patterson Dental. We'd also like to welcome our guests from the Arkansas AGD, California AGD, and Texas AGD that are newer to our webinar series. Uh, we've been running these webinars for about a week and a half or more, and we plan to continue running them for another three weeks. We've got a great lineup of speakers, so please take a look at the uh, slideshow that's going by. If there's something on there that interests you, you can use the QR code to register for those uh, webinars, or you can go to the uh, Washington Academy uh, General Dentistry website. That's WashingtonAGD.org, or you can uh, watch these um, webinars later on YouTube. Uh, every webinar should be up within a day or so on YouTube, and that's at Washington AGD uh, on the YouTube uh, channel there. Um, some housekeeping, CE. We will be recording CE for our AGD members automatically. We will be submitting that to the Academy of General Dentistry. However, do not be looking for it to be on your transcript anytime soon. It will be two to four weeks before that shows up on there. It's just a massive backlog of uh, CE with the Academy of General Dentistry right now. You will be getting a copy of your CE receipt uh, in the next uh, one to two days that will be coming to your email that you registered for this CE event for this webinar. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you're not an AGD member, consider becoming an AGD member. We provide very good continuing education to general dentists and we do have some specialists that are members of our organization. Uh, we're continuing to look for great speakers to bring to you over the next three weeks. Thank you for the recommendations from Arkansas. Thank you for the recommendations from the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prosthodontics. Um, these QR codes should take you to uh, the, the registration websites. If they do not, again, please just go to the www.washingtonagd.org and look for our CE events there. Uh, we're doing our best to keep our website up to date, uh, but uh, we're a volunteer organization here at the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, so if you don't see something, please come back or refresh your browser settings uh, and we should have that up for you. Now, I want to thank some other people that have helped us uh, put this uh, series together. Uh, I want to thank our executive director, Valerie Bartoli from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Gary, Gary Hayamoto for being one of our panelists. And I'd like to thank Dr. Pressett for uh, putting together the website. We couldn't be doing this without these uh, people, so much appreciated. I just want to remind everybody that's watching these webinars that every single one of these presenters has volunteered their time. There is no honorariums being paid to these people whatsoever. Uh, we're bringing CE to you uh, at a great cost, that cost being nothing uh, during this pandemic. And hopefully it's uh, helping you catch up on some topics that, you, that you've been 
uh, wanting to get to. Um, you know, the, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, we welcome anybody that wants to watch these webinars. Please, if you have friends that are not AGD members, they can watch. They can get CE credit. Your hygienist can get CE credit. Your assistants, your front desk staff, office manager. Heck, if your mom wants to watch it, she can watch it too. So, we're getting close to the hour here, and I'm seeing that our numbers are really increasing on who's signed in. Uh, we'll just give a minute or so before we uh, get to our introduction of Dr. Schuler. Um, today, I want to remind you if you have questions for Dr. Schuler, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom. Okay, that's different than your chat feature. Chat feature is fine if you want to type in there, great lecture or anything along those lines. If you have an actual question for Dr. Schuler, please put it in the Q&A section. Uh, try and keep your questions fairly short uh, as uh, this is our third webinar today and uh, getting a little burnt out despite not being the person that presents for an hour, hour and a half. Um, Okay, we're on the hour. It looks like we have about 550 people uh, already signed in. That number's clicking along. So uh, with that, I'd like to again acknowledge our sponsors, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the University of Washington School of Dentistry Academy of General Dentistry Student Study Club. Uh, I'd like to thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prostodontics, uh, University of Washington Continuing Education, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society. Thank you, Patterson Dental, and thank you, Comet USA, for helping put these uh, uh, webinars together. Now, our speaker today is a, a close personal friend, and I, I really appreciate him offering to do this lecture, Multiple Implants in the Aesthetic Zone, Expanding on Your Options. Uh, this is a presentation I've seen before, and I, I really, really enjoy this one. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ralph Schuler. Dr. Schuler graduated from the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany, with a dental degree in 1991. He then was appointed a full-time assistant professor in the Department of Prostodontics at the University of Cologne, Germany, until 1994. During his tenure, he successfully defended his Doctor of Medical Dentistry thesis. After leaving academia, Dr. Schuler maintained a general practice in Erlangen, Germany, before relocating to Seattle in 1999, where he completed his specialty training in periodontics and implant dentistry at the University of Washington, Seattle. Subsequently, Dr. Schuler was appointed affiliate associate professor at the Department of Graduate Periodontics at the University of Washington. Dr. Schuler is a board certified periodontist and a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology and maintains a private practice in Tequila, Washington, specializing in periodontics and implant dentistry. Dr. Schuler has published several articles in peer reviewed journals and has lectured both nationally and internationally. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Schuler. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here in just a second, Dr. Schuler, and let you share your screen so we can get on with your presentation. Again, um, I just want to emphasize that CE will be emailed to uh, our participants who are registered. You will get a full hour of CE for this webinar. I know there's some rumors going around that we only give out half the credit. There's no half credits. You get a full CE credit. Uh, if you want to watch this uh, webinar again, look for it on YouTube at Washington Aid Academy of General Dentistry. And that uh, this webinar and many of our others will be up uh, within a day or so. So with that, Dr. Schuler, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome. Thank you very much. So now I try to put on my screen here. Give me one second.
Let me see here, where is my... Is this uh, up and running now? No, you're not. It's sometimes tricky. Uh, do share screen. Let's do it again here. Let's see. Desktop one. Try one more time. Okay, screen sharing has started, so that's good. Now I just try to see. Is this coming up now? It is, but the uh, that's your presenter view. You can always stop sharing the screen and reshare, or sometimes I find Let's see here. if you just stop your presentation that you started. And then reshare it. And while Dr. Schuler's working on that, we'll just uh, say again, thank you for everyone that's joining us here today for the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, we are lining up new speakers every day. So keep going back to the WashingtonAGD.org website um, and see uh, what speakers we have available. At the end of Dr. Schuler's presentation, I'll put up another PowerPoint that lists upcoming speakers again. Okay. Hmm. You may just need hmm. to close Keynote down for a second. And then bring her back up. Desktop two. Okay, so why is this not? Still the same? You're not seeing it? Yeah, no. Go ahead and share your screen again. And then. Oh, I think now it might yeah. work. Give me one. Yeah it's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a little. And did we go through this before? Yes, people. We've yes. done this. We've tried to work with all our speakers, but hey, it's. Uh... So is this, does this look better now? Well, you are giving me uh, your speaker notes there and not the actual. So hmm. uh, why don't you flop the displays? Oh. Hmm. Okay, so are now. Okay. Are you using two monitors? Yeah, I'm using two monitors, but you're saying um, now you're seeing basically. Yeah, can not... you go up to the top there on your a keynote and maybe uh, does it say swap display? The one on the. How is this? Now? Ah, there we go. Oh. Thank you very much, Dr. Schuler. All right, I'm going okay. to mute myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, nice invitation here and the nice introduction. I would like to share with you multiple anterior implants, and we will have a short, as Dr. Hess said already, we will have a short Q&A at the end of this presentation. But please feel free to contact me at any time with concerns or questions using this email address here. If you have any questions after the presentation, even the following days, please use this email address and contact me. I would like to focus my presentation today on the peri-implant tissue drape 
and how to predict aesthetically pleasing results and long-term outcome. The predictors of aesthetic success we will discuss today are mainly concerned with the so-called pink aesthetic score, which essentially provides an objective way to assess the peri-implant tissues. It is essentially a rating system that assigns zero to two points to one of the following five features, the mesial papilla, the distal papilla, the curvature of the facial mucosa, the level of the facial mucosa, the root convexity, and the soft tissue color and texture. We know, however, that it is very, very difficult to make an accurate prediction, especially about the future, as Niels Bohr already realized more than 70 years ago. And we are currently experiencing this firsthand during the COVID-19 pandemic. On the left graph, you see the prediction from the Institute for Health Metrics, that is actually an institute at the University of Washington. And when you compare this prediction that was done on March 27th to the one that was done about Monday this week, so a few days ago, you see a pretty difficult and different scenario between those two um, screens. They are just two and a half weeks apart. So it's therefore probably equally important for us as dentists they will not only try to predict an outcome, but also try to be what's called as anti-fragile as possible to a source of harm that leads to a non-predicted negative outcome. Anti-fragility is defined as a convex response to variation. And what you see in the left picture here is the sundial outside the University of Washington Medical Center. And in my opinion, it's a perfect illustration of that concept. The winter path here on top shows a convex graph and its implication is that you're harmed much less by a variation than you can benefit from it. The lower summer path represents a concave function with the exact opposite implication. That is more harm than benefit from volatility. And we come back to this later at the end of this presentation. Before we start exploring multiple dental implants, I would like to show you our standard protocol for single tooth implant restoration and then apply some of those concepts to multiple dental implants. This here is a typical case we encounter in our office on a routine basis. A patient with a fractured hopeless central incisor was referred for extraction and immediate implant placement therapy. First, we would get all the diagnostics necessary, including photos, measurements, dental radiographs, and a cone beam CT scan to plan the correct implant position, length, and the angulation of the implant. Next, the tooth will be extracted as atraumatically as possible. In this case, using a mechanical extraction device to minimize the amount of trauma to the peri-implant hard and soft tissues. Alternatively, a tooth could also be cut buccolingually with a surgical length round burr and then sectioned in two fragments with an elevator. The shorter root fragment, in this case the mesial fragment, will then be mobilized first and elevated towards the distal, and then atraumatically removed with tissue pickups typically. The longer, we go back here, the longer root fragment will then subsequently mobilize towards the mesial and removed without applying any pressure to the buccal plate in an attempt to minimize the overall surgical trauma. We would then place the implant leaving at least 1.5 millimeter of space between the implant and the buccal plate and fill this horizontal gap with slowly resorbing rehydrated DBBM. Subsequently, autogenous tissue is harvested from the palate vault and positioned buccal to the dental implant. The connective tissue is typically harvested from the palate vault through a single incision trapdoor technique starting at the lingual aspect of the first molar. The incision is then carried around the palatal curvature and extended to the lateral or sometimes even central incisor, depending on the amount of tissue that needs to be harvested. This extended incision will allow for better flap reflection and visibility. A split thickness mucosa flap is then prepared, exposing the underlying connective tissue. So to essentially get access to the tissue you want to harvest. Anatomical limitations, mainly a prominent palatal root of the maxillary first molar 
and close vicinity to the greater palatine artery will limit the donor site to an area mesial to the palatal root of the first molar. Harvesting tissue from an area distal to the maxillar first molar carries an elevated risk for palatal recession post-surgically. The donor tissue is then circumscribed, mesial, distal, and of course apically as well, and carefully detached from its underlying periosteum and bone with a sharp number 15 or number 15C blade. This so-called sharp dissection carries a substantial risk to cause palatal bleeding, and one needs to be prepared to ligate the greater palatine artery, artery in this event. This usually accomplished, is accomplished with a deep 5-0 non-resolvable suture. Additional digital pressure is also helpful to stop the bleeding if needed. Eventually, the graft will be freed and is ready to be used for augmentation. And of course, the size of the graft depends on the purpose of use, and you can harvest tissue from the palate to use for about three to four teeth if needed. Primary implant stability is paramount, and once achieved, a custom healing abutment is fabricated chair side utilizing flowable composite. The peri-implant tissue is then coronally advanced over the connective tissue graft and secured with a 6-0 polypropylene suture. To increase predictability, a temporary restoration is fabricated that is not connected to the implant yet. Ideally, a temporary RPD, or as shown here, a toothborne Essex retainer. This prevents any detrimental micro or macro movement of the implant during osseointegration. Following eight to 10 weeks of osseointegration, which will be clinically assessed by a counter torque testing and radiographically conferred through the absence of peri-implant radiolucencies, the final implant supported restoration will be fabricated and delivered. And this is leading to an acceptable pink aesthetic score and favorable long-term stability. Both the curvature and level of facial mucosa as well as the root convexity and the mesial and distal papillae would yield high pink aesthetic scores. It seems to me, however, that the mesial and distal papillae play a more significant role for aesthetics since more, most aesthetically pleasing smiles do expose the interproximal papillae, but not necessarily the facial. I would therefore argue that we should place more emphasis on the interproximal than on the facial mucosal tissues. These are now 18 implant supported central incisor crowns that were consecutively treated and are now in situ for more than five years with acceptable pink aesthetic scores. However, if we just picked three restorations randomly, we would certainly agree that subtle differences in their pink aesthetic scores would be noticeable. Why does the patient on the right exhibit more tissue loss than the one in the middle, and the middle one more than the patient on the left? Ceteris paribus, all three patients received standard of care restorations with perfect fit and ideal sub and super gingival contours. Well, let's take a look at the interproximal hard and soft tissues a bit more closely. This is the radiograph of an implant supported restoration that has been in function for nine months to allow for completion of bone and soft tissue remodeling. Let's just add the soft tissue and now measure the average distance between the tip of the papilla to the peri-implant bone level. We would typically find a tissue depth of about seven millimeters, give or take. This number, however, is completely meaningless since it varies with the next measurement, which is much more important, and that's the tissue depth of the adjacent tooth. Here we get measurements that are much, much lower in the range of 4.5 millimeter. In other words, we can predict roughly 4.5 millimeter of tissue height measured from the interproximal bone level, but not on the implant, but on the tooth adjacent to the implant. How does this now compare to multiple dental implants placed side by side? And how come that we run into scenarios like those once in a while? And more importantly, how could this have been predicted and hence avoided? 
This, by the way, is a case that has been published a few years ago in the journal Inside Dentistry. Okay, so let's go through the same exercise again, but now we look at two implants placed side by side. Superimpose the corresponding radiograph and add the soft tissue back in and measure. This time we would now find a number that is even lower than the 4.5 millimeter between an implant and a tooth. Now we would measure only about three millimeters on average. Why is this the case? How does the implant, why does the implant recede as soon as we remove the tooth next to an implant? Well, if we took histological sections of those two areas here marked with a white box, we would find that as shown in the left slide, the interproximal tissue between an implant and a tooth is connected to the tooth cementum through a periodontal ligament and connective tissue attachment. This is significantly different to the histological findings between two implants as seen in the right picture, where neither, nor, neither root cementum nor a periodontal ligament nor connective tissue attachment are present. In other words, we're essentially looking at a sort of scar tissue around dental implants. This of course means on the other hand that we have to accept biological drawbacks unless we will be able to engineer cementum and or periodontal ligament on dental implants. Once we realize that the expected or predicted papillary tissue height on implants is dependent on the bone of the adjacent tooth or the bone in between the implants, Let's find out what we actually know about the inter-implant bone levels themselves. Once implants are placed, the bone level between them should sit at an imaginary line between the bone levels on the adjacent teeth. And this, by the way, is the maximum bone height that can be accomplished, a phenomenon we will see a bit later in this presentation in more detail. Once the implants are placed, bone remodeling sets in and a new biologic width will be established around the implants. Important to note that this biologic width is, has also a horizontal component that will eventually lead to the typical bone loss we see around every single implant. Those two phenomena taken together, the reduced soft tissue height and the overlapping bone remodeling during os integration will lead to an aesthetic disaster like this one. Eventually, we need to accept that there are limitations and try to develop strategies to avoid aesthetic problems. Four main strategies seem to be useful, starting with the prevention of inter-implant bone loss, achieving or better working under symmetry, and then if necessary, augment peri-implant heart and or soft tissues. We covered the implications of inter-implant distance already, but how can implant properties help preserving bone. More specifically, does platform switching or platform shifting improve the bone levels between implants? This concept was already discovered more or less by accident in the late 80s and refers to placing narrow restorative abutments on implants with a wider non-matching platform. Let's assume for a second that we have a 4.1 millimeter external hex implant that's placed adjacent to one another is seen in this simulation. The bone level between those two implants would look somewhat like this. If we now use an implant system that has a wider implant platform than the corresponding crown, all we do is replace the 4.1 millimeter implant with a wider platform. The peak of bone in between them, which is ultimately predictive of the tissue height, remember that the tissue height is on average three millimeter coronal to the peak of bone, would be essentially left unchanged. Those radiographs now show real life examples. On the left, platform switched implants, and on the right, traditional style implants. And both show a very similar pattern of angular bone remodeling, leaving the inter-implant peak of bone essentially untouched. So platform switching might be an interesting concept to increase overall bone to implant contact, but it might not necessarily be useful to obtain better aesthetic results. My favorite strategy is symmetry. That is symmetry across the maxillary midline. In other words, have the same teeth restored with implants in the first 
and second quadrant. The easiest and most predictable scenario is the restoration of two lateral incisors. Both implants are placed in the flapless procedure is seen in the middle picture. An autogenous tissue has been added facially to mimic root prominence. This is a minimally invasive and predictable surgery which should almost always generate good pink aesthetic scores, mainly due to symmetry. How about now two central incisors? Let's spend a little bit of time and try to predict the final outcome based on what we have discussed so far. So teeth number eight and nine are structurally compromised, carry a hopeless prognosis and are scheduled for extraction and immediate implant replacement. Radiographically acceptable bone levels are evident mesial to both lateral incisors and in between teeth number eight and nine. Additionally, adequate space seems to be present between teeth number eight and nine, allowing for implants to be positioned more than three millimeters apart. And we are looking at a symmetrical situation. So all in all, positive predictors. Let's see what was done and how it turned out. As discussed earlier, extractions were accomplished as atraumatically as possible. Implants were aligned to exit through the cingula and bone grafts were placed. Custom healing abutments were then fabricated chair side and torqued to 15 Newton centimeters, followed by the insertion of a temporary RPD. Now watch how the tissue will heal. After about 10 weeks, we are faced with uneven free gingival margins, facial to the implants eight and nine. At this point, fixture level impressions were taken and provisional restorations were fabricated in the laboratory. The key step is an ideal full contour wax-up, as shown in the left slide. And this wax-up will not follow the stone contours, but rather the stone, as shown in the middle slide, will be adjusted to allow for ideal provisional contours. This is a crucial step since, the, since it allows perfect control over the position of the final facial free gingival margin and interproximal papillae. The custom healing abutments will then be removed and following insertion of the provisional restorations, slight tissue blanching is to be expected, which should subside within five minutes of seeding. If it does not subside, minor adjustments of the provisional contours might become necessary. The provisional restorations are then torqued to 15 Newton centimeters and re-evaluated a few weeks later to assess their aesthetic outcome. Modifications will be made as needed until an acceptable pink aesthetic scores, score is reached. This slide shows the peri-implant tissues at final impressions. The erythematous appearance is not a sign of inflammation, but represents the junctional epithelial attachment that has been established between the implant restoration and the surrounding tissues, and is actually a good sign. The last step for a predictable aesthetic outcome is now the fabrication of custom impression copings prior to final impressions. This is an easy task to perform and does not take more than five minutes of your chair time, but will have an extremely positive effect on the final sub and equigingival contours of the implant supported crowns. In the left picture, you see two lab analogs mounted in a pixie cup with stone. The provisional crowns were removed from the oral cavity cleaned and attached to the analogs. On the right side, fast setting PVS has been injected in, a, in the cup and allowed to set. Following removal of the provisional crowns, stock impression copings are attached to the lab analogs and the void filled with flowable composite. Those custom impression copings are then used for the final impressions using a standard open tray impression technique. This provides the lab technician with information not only of the implant position, but also the exact tissue form as established during the provisional stage. And here's the main advantage of this extra step. Following removal of the provisional restorations, the final screw retained restorations will be delivered and no tissue blanching or black triangles should be encountered at this point. In other words, the final restoration should exactly match the gingival contours that were developed during the provisional stage and then transferred to the laboratory using the custom impression copings. 
the final restoration five years later with acceptable pink aesthetic scores. Why? Because we had straight bone levels on teeth number seven through 10 to begin with, symmetry across the midline, and adequate inter implant distance, which allowed the peak of bone between both implants to remain unaffected. Okay, taking it up a notch, highly scalloped gingival architectures always raise red flags among periodontists due to their instability and unpredictable behavior. Again, as with the previous case, teeth number eight and nine were diagnosed as unrestorable and therefore referred for extraction and immediate implant therapy. The same surgical protocol as mentioned earlier was followed, including atraumatical extraction, bone grafting, and fabrication of custom healing abutments. The radiographs taken post-operatively shows an adequate distance between both implants and excellent peri-implant bone levels. But watch what happens during osteointegration and bone remodeling when both implants were restored with implant-supported restoration approximately 10 weeks following placement. As predicted, the typical bone remodeling pattern also prevailed. But all in all, acceptable gingival aesthetics have been achieved in this challenging case. Tangible tissue loss did not occur between both implants, but rather between implant number nine and a new crown that was fabricated on tooth number 10. Why? And could this have been predicted? Well, if you look again at the pre-op radiographs, we certainly appreciate lower than ideal bone levels at the mesial aspect of tooth number 10 which eventually led to a less than ideal papilla between implant number nine and tooth number 10. Okay, now let's take a look at less favorable conditions, namely asymmetric situations, when we are faced with differential implant distributions between both maxillary anterior quadrants. The aesthetic outcome in this category depends extremely on the distribution of the remaining teeth. As long as adjacent teeth, that is teeth mesial and distal to the planned implants are present, we are anti-fragile. Here two implants in locations number nine and 11 are ready for impressions. And as with the previous case, a stone cast with corresponding lab analogs is poured and an ideal full contour wax up is fabricated. The stone will then again be carved back and modified to match the design of the wax up. And again, two provisional screw retained restorations will be fabricated. Screw retained provisionals are advantageous over cement retained crowns for mainly two reasons. They don't require cementation and hence eliminate the risk of residual excess cement. And maybe even more importantly, allow to exert pressure against the peri-implant tissues during insertion, thereby serving as a guided tissue generation device which just direct the tissues facially and interproximally as needed. As a rule of thumb, the less pressure the provisional restoration exerts on the interproximal tissues, the more papillary tissue height can be expected. And the more pressure will be put on the facial tissues during the temporary phase, the more will the facial tissue be displaced apically. This is the only acceptable way to guide the tissue from a position as seen in the left slide to its ideal position on the right. Surgical intervention is not indicated at this stage and should be avoided at all costs. Once the tissue has been guided into its ideal position for both implants in locations number nine and 11, and the patient is satisfied with the aesthetic appearance, it's again time for final impressions using custom impression copings with an open tray impression technique. The delivery of the final screw retained implant supported restorations should again be uneventful. So both implants crowns are exact replicas of the provisional restorations, especially subgingivally, so much so that no tissue blanching or black triangles are present at the day of delivery due to the ideal, ideal soft tissue contours that have been developed during the provisional phase and communicated with the dental laboratory. This will lead to aesthetically pleasing and stable long-term term conditions. And as mentioned earlier, the presence or absence of interdental papillae 
seems to be more important for an aesthetic appearance than the pink aesthetic score of the facial mucosa around implants, unless a patient presents with a high smile line. Good, so let's switch gears now and talk about the most challenging situation, adjacent missing teeth that are asymmetrically distributed across the midline. Now, pointing out the obvious, but this is only challenging in patients who are actually exposed to their gingival tissues. Patients like him do not pose any problems since no gingival tissues are exposed, even on a big smile. Nobody would be able to tell that teeth number seven through 10 are implant supported restorations. Gingival architecture, however, which we briefly discussed a few minutes ago when we talked about how to restore those two missing central incisors, is a force to be reckoned with in asymmetrical situations when two or more adjacent teeth are missing. With thin scallop biotypes being the most challenging architecture, what options do we have in situations like this to avert aesthetic fiascos? Well, we could just place one implant for a two unit implant supported restoration to avoid the remodeling bone loss and then add hard and soft tissue to over augment the site. I would like to share now with you three patients who needed a fixed implant supported restoration to replace teeth number nine and 10 but every patient was treated with a different therapeutic modality. So you can compare the results and decide for yourself. Let's start with patient number one. Tooth number nine was missing and tooth number 10 was scheduled for extraction. But in order to minimize the trauma, a staged approach was chosen. First, the implant was placed in the, in the area grafted to create excessive tissue in the implant location. Following flap adaptation with 6O polypropylene sutures, the pontic of the provisional restoration needed to be reduced to allow room for the graft in location number nine before the provisional FPD was re-cemented. Once the implant was integrated, tooth number 10 was removed and the extraction site grafted with hard and soft tissue. The socket graft consisted of a rehydrated senior graft contained with subepithelial connective tissue and the pontic was again reduced to allow for swelling and tissue growth. But once the swelling did subside and a new provisional restoration was placed, a significant discrepancy was already noticeable between the papillae distal to tooth number eight and distal to implant number nine, which did as predicted not improve once the final implant supported two unit cantilever restoration was delivered. Now, one could argue that tooth number 10 should have been extruded prior to extraction therapy in order to improve the crestal bone level distal to implant number nine. Well, let's take a look at patient number two. To answer this question, what do we accomplish with orthodontic extrusion prior to extraction? Teeth number nine and 10 were hopeless and planned for two immediate implants. This patient was referred from an orthodontist and was undergoing minor orthodontic tooth movement mainly to alleviate the crowding on the lower front. The orthodontist was therefore asked to slowly extrude teeth number nine and 10 and develop as much bone and tissue as possible with orthodontic means. And he did. He brought the bone between teeth nine and 10 as far coronal as he could before both teeth were extracted and replaced with two immediate dental implants. But watch what happened with the bone in between both implants after osteointegration. The bone underwent extensive remodeling to a level in line with the bone of the adjacent teeth eight and 11. So the interproximal bone that was so nicely brought down orthodontically remodeled back between both implants in no time once the teeth were extracted. That means that orthodontic extrusion for the most part is only valuable as long as the extruded tooth or teeth are kept, but loses most of its benefits once the extruded tooth or teeth are removed. The bone will once again recede back to an imaginary line between the bone levels of the adjacent teeth. And sure enough, once the provisional restoration were placed, a significant discrepancy between the papilla distal to tooth number eight and distal to implant number nine was noticeable. 
and the final restorations three years after completion of treatment. Now, what's interesting to note is that the pink aesthetic score in this case, despite orthodontic eruption, does not differ significantly from the previous one. Here again on the right side for comparison, it seems that the asymmetrical situation in combination with a highly scalloped gingival biotype is the main driver for a less than ideal aesthetic outcome. Okay, now let's look at patient number three, where we combined multiple soft and hard tissue grafts with the placement of only one implant and a cantilever implant supported restoration. Would this now provide a better outcome? Let's find out. Patient number three clearly presents a clinical scenario nobody wants to run into. Extensive horizontal and vertical ridge deficiencies as evidenced by the amount of pink acrylic that had to be added to the temporary RPD. What options do we have? Well, first, heart tissue ridge augmentation either through block grafting, distraction osteogenesis, or guided bone regeneration, which was selected in this case. Following, in this case, following guided bone regeneration and six months of healing, the titanium reinforced EPTFE membrane was removed and an ideal soft and osseous crest has been regenerated. Once again, the best crest shape that can be accomplished has the form of a straight line between the bone levels on the adjacent teeth, as you can see in the left slide. Only one implant was then placed and the area grafted with additional connective tissue harvested from the patient's palatal vault. Following three months of osseointegration, a second stage procedure was performed and a custom healing abutment fabricated with flowable composite. But even with all of these extra steps and surgeries, the final restoration proves to be clearly deficient on the distal aspect of implant number nine compared to the mesial aspect of tooth number eight. The pink acrylic material on the temporary RPD shows the amount of interdental papilla height that would have been necessary to mimic the contralateral site and clearly reveals an uneven gingival aesthetic line of about 1.5 millimeter, which also did not improve, improve over year to years and leads me to believe that neither one of those three techniques will lead to an outstanding aesthetic result. And the discrepancy between the papillary level distal to tooth number eight and nine will always be noticeable. These three cases clearly demonstrate the perfect illusion is not possible in situations of asymmetry in the presence of scalloped gingival biotypes. I would like, however, to end on a positive note and show you three maxillary anterior implants unevenly distributed, but in a patient with a flat gingival biotype, a category that it's typically easier to deal with. Teeth number seven, nine, and 10 were scheduled for extraction and implant placement therapy. So let's assess the preoperative situation. We already noticed that this is a patient that presents with a flat gingival biotype, which makes the case much easier and more predictable to treat. However, what is the main problem in this situation? Well, it's the close proximity of teeth number nine and 10, which would certainly have an impact on the implant position and final bone level between implants number nine and 10. If in situations like these, the placement of two implants is requested, the only option to overcome this root proximity problem is to employ a sequential approach, which means that you would place an immediate implant first in location number 10, and then following osseointegration, place the second adjacent implant 10 weeks later with the idea that the bone around implant number 10 had now enough time to heal and revascularize after the inflicted trauma of extraction and implant placement. This would provide acceptable aesthetics and bone levels in flat gingival biotype situations, even in the absence of abundant inter-implant space. Okay, so to summarize the last 140 slides, I would like to conclude that we're dealing with a different biologic response around implants compared to teeth, and that implants rely more on tissue adhesion than on true attachment, and that implant positioning 
and adequate treatment planning is most important, especially when multiple teeth need to be replaced with dental implants in the aesthetic zone. We also reviewed multiple site enhancement procedures procedures and included and concluded that they might not yield the wanted results at times. But it's probably fair to say that it's extremely beneficial whenever possible to retain teeth next to implants as they serve as an anchor to maintain papillary tissue height. That symmetrical situations are more favorable as they camouflage minor tissue alterations without being noticeable and that in the absence of adjacent teeth and symmetry, a patient with flat gingival biotype is certainly less challenging to treat. Under any circumstances, one should be paying utmost attention not to place implants too close together. And dental implants surrounded by teeth, symmetrically distributed across the maxillar midline in patients with flat gingival biotypes and placed at least three millimeters apart carry a favorable predictive value, but equally important. And to come back one more time to the picture of the sundial outside the medical center of the University of Washington, try to position yourself as anti-fragile as possible and avoid cases where two or more adjacent teeth are missing in one quadrant in a patient with a highly scalloped gingival architecture and a high smile line. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I think we still have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you very much. Yes, we do, Dr. Schuler. Thank you very, very much. I, I love that presentation. I, it's funny, I learn something from it every time. So thank you. All righty, let's just start hitting some of these questions. Uh, some of the surgeries you did and cases illustrated them, but we'll go through again. Um, first question is Can you obtain gingival embrasure tissue? by scalloping the ridge with a surgical round burr on the day of implant placement. So let's go back to the one slide. I think that is what's addressing this, uh, this question. So when you have a situation, and I'm trying to find the slide here, give me one second. When you have a situation like this one on the left, can you see my um, my mouse? Uh, it's not. No. Can you see it now? Oh yeah, can yeah, we okay, can. Perfect. It's just tiny. Okay. Per oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. So when you have a situation like this, where you have excessive tissue, and you bring this tissue from here to here, and you feel or you think that just using a provisional restoration to guided tissue generation, as I call it, if you feel that would put too much pressure, you could alleviate the tissue. You could cut the tissue a little bit, but I would be very, very careful and I would not overcut the tissue because it's so easy to remove tissue and cut it away. And then when it's you know, cut away, it's very, very difficult to bring it back. The, the big advantage of using your provisional to guide the tissue is that you actually have perfect control over the tissue at the end, and you will also maintain the texture of the tissue, which is typically stippled gingiva. And so by cutting it away, sometimes you get closer to the mucogingival junction, which mm -hmm. is a little bit less aesthetically pleasing. So I, I hope this sort of addresses and answers the question of the um, participant. Okay. Uh, patients number seven and eight fractured off and ridge healed flat across. What do you use to shape gingiva for best papilla slash aesthetics? I think this kind of addresses the, uh, the same issues a little bit. So the key is really to understand. And now I try to really give you three pointers. So the key is to understand that the bone, the bone underneath the tissue as the old saying goes, sets the tone. So you have to make sure that the bone is sort of flat. Do you have as much bone as you can get? And then you can count on about three millimeters of tissue coronal to the bone. Once you have this, you use your provisional to carve, like you see on the middle picture here, you carve the right free gingival margin, if you will, into this excess tissue. But there's no surgical technique when you place a provisional or when you place the implant and the bone is not at the right 
level at the right site to augment this at the time of implant placement by a so-called flap design. So this is, I think, a little bit of a misconception that has been taught you know, for years, but I don't think it will actually lead to aesthetically pleasing outcomes. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you insert the palatal split thickness graft tissue with a flapless surgery as mentioned with teeth number seven and 10? Yeah, perfect. So this was the first clinical case I actually showed. And the question is, how do you get this tissue in between the implant, the abutment, and the tissue? So for this, I use a very, very tiny ophthalmic knife. That's a very tiny knife that allows you to maneuver in between the abutment of the implant, the implant, and sharply dissect the buccal tissue to create a pouch more or less. Once you created this pouch, then you would insert the tissue and then you just secure it with a, you know, 70 micro suture or 60 polypropylene sutures. But the key to this is to use one of those really, really tiny little blades. If you don't have those, then it's pretty much impossible to kind of pouch it and create enough room to insert the tissue. Are immediate load provisional abutment and crowns contraindicated for anteriors? So the question is, I guess, if I understood it correctly, if you can load an immediately placed implant with a provisional. Is that sort of the question? Yeah, yeah. basically immediate loading of uh, yeah. anterior provisionals. So let me, let me and, and this to me, I think is, is really, really an important question. And let me go to this, to my favorite picture here of the sundial at the University of Washington. So what I'm trying to show here, and again, I don't know if you can see it. Is it coming up? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, so what you see here is essentially, I think the more we can position ourselves under a convex curve, meaning if something goes wrong, if something goes wrong, what we lose is much less, and I don't know if you see, if you see the mouse that's moving to the left here, you're losing much less, much less than what you would gain with the same procedure. And I think immediately loading implants, especially immediately placed implants, carry a higher risk that this implant will fail. And if that's the only really option for the patient, if the patient says, you know what, I want this implant and I want a provisional crown put on, I think we sit down, I have to sit down with the patient and say, okay, these are the risks and there is a higher risk that when this fails and you're going down the lower path, you might end up with much, much, much more problems at the end. Versus if we do the implant, it will not immediately load it. Yes, there's maybe six, eight weeks where you have to wear an Essex retainer, a, an RPD, or you can even bond a tooth to the adjacent teeth. But then it's almost a guarantee that you're up here. And if anything, you will go up this path, but you will never ever slide down this path down here. And so, Again, in, 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 my, in my opinion, I think it's much safer to not connect a provisional restoration to an immediately placed implant. Okay, thank you. Uh, how often would you recommend checking healing of the soft tissue contours prior to final impression? That's an excellent question. So it depends first on, does the tissue blanch when you put the provisional crown in. So if it does, and if it does not go away within five minutes, I would actually have the patient come back the next day, the next day and see if there's still some you know, tissue necrosis or tissue blanching. If that's the case, you have to take immediate action. If you put the provisional in and then you let the patient go and the you know, blanching has subsided within those five minutes, it's probably two or three weeks that's needed for the tissue to develop towards the final tissue profile. So two to three weeks, I would typically wait for the tissue to come back. And what's helping is actually those custom healing abutments. So we typically put those custom healing abutments on at the day of implant placement. And if you do this, we already get a almost perfect profile of the soft tissue surrounding the implant. And then it only takes an extra, you know, small step to get the perfect peri-implant tissues. And so two to three weeks, I would typically wait before the patient comes back. And if everything looks good at this point, you can even already schedule for final impressions and finish the case. 
Okay, so along the same lines of what you were saying there, can you please go over steps for provisionalizing custom anterior implants as shown by your step, this step by step, please? Okay, so let's let's go back here. I think it's probably easiest if I bring up the slides here one more time. Give you one please. second. So this is this is a very good point because that's that's key, I think. So let's look at the Let's look at this one case here one more time. So again, can you see it on the screen? Yes. Okay, so let's, let's use this case here. And the one implant, the provisional, the custom healing abutment on this one implant is obviously much more coronal than the one on the implant number nine. So let, let's assume we take impressions at this stage and then go to the lab. So at the lab, you don't really worry about the stone yet at this point. So the left slide shows an idea wax up. So you don't worry about where's the stone, what is the impression actually giving you. And once you have an idea wax up with the exact position, with the correct position of the free ginger margin, now, and this is shown in the middle picture, now you take a burr to it and you carve the idea free ginger margin and sub gingival contours into the stone. So that's why I think a stone model is typically advantageous over a soft tissue moulage. Because at this, with stone, you can actually carve it the way you want it. And then this is your blueprint. This is basically how you now make the provisional restorations. And that's what's seen on the right side. Typically, obviously this is done in the laboratory. And you can use acrylic, you can use composite. But on the right side, you see then the provisionals. And those provisionals here have a, um, a plastic base. I would typically recommend not using a plastic base, but maybe a metal one because it's a little bit more sturdy. Yeah. But on the left side, you see that those provisionals have the correct contours. And now on the right side, the picture on the right side shows how those contours kind of guide the tissue. And this is pretty much just like a minute. This picture is taken a minute after those provisional have been inserted. So again, if you use those provisionals, you would use a lab and have the lab or do it in the lab and have a perfect control over the contours and everything um, versus if you do a provisional at the day of implant placement, which gives you much less um, control and much less versatility. Okay, so do you ever take an implant fixture impression the day of the implant placement for your provisionals? Yes, that's a very good point. I, I took those pictures out, but yes, absolutely. So you can take an, an impression, you can take an impression right there and then, or what's even more elegant is just to do an index. So you just use an index and index your implant position against either your guide or you have a little vacuum form sucked mm -hmm. down, and then you just index your implant position to this to this guide. Because again, you don't really need information on the soft tissue because that's what you're gonna develop later in the laboratory. So yeah, you can take an impression or if you wanna avoid squirting impression material into the extraction site, you can use an index and just kind of glue the index, the impression coping with a little bit of pattern resin to your guide or to your Essex retainer. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm leaving out all the comments about a great lecture and all that kind of stuff, but <laughs> uh, we're getting lots of those. So uh, uh, what is your approach in dealing with cases with no attached gingiva? Is it predictable if you immediate versus delayed option? Very good. So I, 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 I sort of discussed it a little bit during the presentation, but typically in the anterior maxilla, so the areas from let's say five through 12, most of the time we have really enough attached tissue. We have enough keratinized tissue. And in those areas, it's typically not a problem to deal with. The only issue we run into is if we do excessive rich augmentation and we have to coronally advance the gingiva and the mucogingival junction, then at the second stage, we have to sort of lower the mucogingival junction again. And that sometimes causes a little bit of problems. It's much more of an issue on the, on the mandible but again, in the mandible, it's not an aesthetic scenario. And I'm much more you know, inclined to leave just a millimeter and a half or two millimeters of keratinized tissue around implants and the posterior mandible. But for the maxillary anterior, the area of number 12 through, you know, number five through 12, 
most of the time there is enough keratinized tissue. Would it be accurate to say symmetry is obtained with the apical repositioning of the papilla with a longer contact between the incisors? Yes, yes. I think th this is obviously one option, but I, I think you have to be really, really careful because this would essentially then expose roots on the contralateral teeth. So let's say in a situation where you have teeth number nine and 10 missing, and now you know that sort of the papilla between nine and 10 will be deficient. In order to correct this and make it more aesthetically pleasing, of course you could go ahead and lower the papilla between eight and nine and also between seven and eight. But this of course would then expose really root and would make those teeth, you know, not as, as healthy. I think that's the big, um, downside of, of this sort of procedure. You would, at the expense of symmetry, cause maybe more damage to the contralateral teeth than it's warranted. Alrighty. Any comments in regards to your experience with ceramic implants and their possible advantages over titanium? Yeah, so I, I really don't use at this point ceramic implants from a tissue healing point of view, it is essentially the same. I mean, there's not sort of any advantages using a zirconia implant over titanium implants. Um, in terms of long-term stability, I, I really think the data are not out there yet. And so we don't really know if they are holding up long-term. For me, I don't see really a big advantage of using zirconia implants over titanium implants. Um, but again, from an aesthetic point of view, I, I think there's no advantage of using zirconia or ceramic implants. Why open tray and not closed tray impressions? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I think this is um, yeah, up to personal preference. So i am just been using open tray impressions pretty much forever in a day. And I think there is a little bit less you know, room for error but if you have very good success with close tray impression um, scenarios, I think there's really no, no difference. Um, I think the, the control you have with an open tray impression um, tray, it's in, in my, and I shouldn't say this because it's always, you know, not a very scientific statement to say in my hands, but I think th this works better for me, but I don't think there's a big difference. And if you look at the literature, you will probably find pros and cons for both uh, impression techniques. Okay. Are you using ICSQ values? No, I don't. I do not. So the last time I've used those, uh, this machine was, I think, almost like 17 years ago at the University of Washington. And I don't really see an advantage. I, I really don't. Because when when you when you finish the case when you do the final impressions i mean the implant needs to be integrated and i think it doesn't really matter what the isq uh, value shows so you have to be you have it has to look aesthetically good so there should be no inflammation on the tissue the radiograph should look um acceptable and then when you take the impressions or when you do the counter torque testing that's i think the test that will show you if an implant will be ready to be restored or not. I think there's nothing wrong with using, let's say this Ostel device or other devices that are around to check for ISQ, but I don't think it gives you any additional benefits over just using counter torque testing, checking um, that the tissue looks healthy and also having radiographs that show the peri-implant bone levels. Uh, someone saw an amalgam tattoo on one of your cases. Any advice on how to predictably get rid of an amalgam tattoo? Oh, if you do, if you, well, it depends a little bit what the amalgam tattoo is. If you have an amalgam tattoo in the mucosa, you can actually excise it and cut it out. And then typically that gets rid of it. If it's in the gingiva, then it's a little bit more difficult because you might have to then use a graft after this has been excised. So it depends a little bit if it's in mucosa tissue or in the gingiva. But the, if needed, uh, the ultimate you know, treatment option would be a connective tissue graft to get rid of any sort of defects that might um, stay after the amalgam tattoo has been removed. 
Can you explain steps it takes to temporize the socket with a flowable composite? And then let's roll in this with another uh, question. How are you determining the ideal custom abutment contour and how do you apply that to the healing abutment? Are you using the extracted tooth as a guide? So for the custom healing abutment, in order to make the custom healing abutment, you remove the tooth, you put the implant in, and then you use a temporary abutment. So you connect the temporary abutment to the implant and then just use the flowable composite to outline the socket. So you have your implant, you have your abutment, and then you just squirt in a little bit of composite to have sort of the shape of the extraction socket. At this point, you take your temporary abutment out and then you fill in the gap, you fill in the void between the implant platform, if you will, and the outline you created with your flowable composite and then polish it outside the mouth. Once it's done outside, you put it back in and apply the torque you need, typically 10 Newton centimeters. But what you don't want to do, you do not want to squirt the um, flowable composite into the extraction socket because then you have no control over where it goes to and how it's actually um, cured. So only you know, make the outline of the, the, the margin of the, uh, of the abutment and then take it out and fill in all the rest. And at this stage, you have to be a little bit creative, I think. You have to sort of anticipate or you have to get, have an idea what the subgingival contour should look like. And then you test it over time and see if those contours are good. And then the final last, you know, five or 10% of tissue improvement you will then get with your provisionals. Okay. How do you feel about provi provisionalizing with the patient's own extracted teeth? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Whenever possible, this, this is a perfect way of doing it, um, to use the tooth and then hollow the tooth out. And, you know, if you want to do it as an immediate provisional, you can do it right there and then, or if you want to do it later, you can use the tooth and just connect it to a temporary abutment of the implant. And also with this point, you then have to add a little bit of flowable composite or acrylic to make it a sturdy restoration. But yes, absolutely. Using the tooth, especially when it's not a, um, a crown tooth, it's a very good option for a provisional. Okay, here's a question from one of our students, Mr. Rosenthal. Do you recommend custom healing abutments for implants that are not placed immediately? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit because if you do, let's say you have an dentures rich and then you have a lot of extra tissue, it is advantageous to put the implant in and put a custom healing abutment on from day one because then you're already helping the tissue guide to get guided into the correct position. So if there is a lot of extra tissue you can use for you know, molding, I, I think it is advantageous. The one mistake you don't wanna do with a custom healing abutment in those cases is you don't wanna overdo it. So you don't wanna press too hard on the tissue or bring the free ginger margin on the fascia side too far apical. Because again, once it's lost and once you you know, pushed it out of the way, it's very, very difficult to regain it. So yeah, if there is, you know, a lot of extra tissue and you want to mold the tissue at the day of implant placement, I would start putting a custom healing abutment on already at this point. But it's not as critical as using it for an immediate implant placement situation. Okay, uh, along those lines, is there any difference in tissue outcome between immediate placement De delayed placement one stage and delayed placement two stage surgeries. In terms of soft tissue and the soft tissue drape, there is no difference at all. And I have a perfect, well, I should say perfect, but I have a presentation on exactly this topic. So there is absolutely no difference if you do it from day one or if you then try to, and you know what, this is actually, let me go back here. This is maybe, uh, what a one, case I showed you. Let me see if I find it. This is almost like a perfect example for this question. Let me go back here. So this is, let's go back to this picture here. So on the left side, you see pretty much an implant that was placed immediately and there was nothing done to the implant. 
and you see all of this tissue that has grown and you know it's just the way it heals the big advantage of a custom healing abutment is that you prepare the tissue already at the time of implant placement in this case which is on the screen right now it took quite a bit of extra you know pressure and pushing to get the tissue from the left side to the middle to the right but if you had started with a custom healing abutment when it when the implant was placed you would have been already a little bit ahead of the curve but yeah the question i think is an excellent one in terms of molding the tissue there's absolutely no difference in the long run if you do it from day one or if you come back later and start molding and the tissue guidance very good question okay do you think uh, a rotated palatal graft could help with the final aesthetic outcome of the lost papilla height no absolutely not so absolutely not those rotated pedagogical grafts they are not they are really not creating more tissue long term you get lucky once in a while and for a short period of time you see a little bit of tissue that's a little bit more coronal that that, that has sort of the appearance of a papilla but over time it will remodel and shrink back so it, it's really in my opinion and the cases I did, it does not help at all. Now, what would help now, if let's say you have a scenario, nine and 10 are missing and you placed implants in nine and you are debating if you should take out number 10 because it's you know not a lot of root and it's a little bit loose and it's not a good crown to root ratio. But if aesthetics is of concern, try, and I try to make this point during this presentation too, but try to keep this tooth number 10 at all costs and then you can use it as anchorage for the tissue and if you need to get the tissue more coronal then you can even extrude the tooth but not like the cases i showed you where the orthodontist extruded teeth and we then took the teeth out you would have to keep the tooth inside you would have to keep the tooth as a attachment for the tissue but the pedagogical graft long term i would even say say medium term it does not hold up what it's what it's promising Right. Warren Libman says, uh, nicely done. Great cases. Thank you. Uh, can I make a custom impression coping with coping on implant in the mouth? Um, yeah, you could. You could. But then you are a little bit, it's, it's up to your imagination because then you have to make it the same way you would make a custom healing abutment so instead of using your um, temporary abutment to make a custom healing abutment you would use your impression coping and then make a custom impression coping out of it in the mouth the same way you would use or you would do um, a custom healing abutment by just you know adding a little bit of composite to get the outline of the socket removing it and then adding all of this extra composite outside the mouth, which again is not the same as using a provisional and copying the provisional, but I think it comes pretty close. Yeah. How important is placing of contact point in the provisional to maintain inter implant bone? I think the, the contact point for bone maintenance, I don't think it is, that critical but the contact point seems to be important to create as much tissue as possible so if you have a good contact point and the embrasure space between a tooth and an implant has the right size form length and shape you can get a little bit more papillary tissue growth the bone underneath is probably not really affected but you will get a little bit of more tissue and you know th this this you see in situations where you have an implant that is not restored with anything and then you put a provisional on and you leave it for a few weeks. Over time you see this embrasure, this gingival embrasure space to be filled with a little bit more tissue than you started out with. Yeah, but I, I don't think the bone underneath will actually, you know, recede or grow because of the absence or, or presence of a, of a contact point. Yeah. What are your thoughts on using PET for preservation of soft and hard tissue ar architecture? I'm not yeah. sure. 
I, 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 again, I mean, I don't want to bring up my, my slide of the University of Washington again, but if, if you use, and some people call it sort of um, a socket shield, if you use a socket shield, there are, there, I would say there are more risks than benefits, especially when you have patients that just don't show the free change of margins. This is like, like treating something that doesn't really need treatment, but on the other hand, you have a higher risk. You have a higher risk that leaving this, um, this tooth, the tooth fragment, more or less, leave it inside you, leave it in place. And then sometimes it doesn't heal completely. Sometimes it might move a little bit. And, and you're taking all those risks for the benefit that might not be really what you're looking for. Now, if you have a patient that has really a high smile line, and that's all that, that matters. Yeah, you, you, you use it. And, but I think you have more, you have just more risk with it. And I think, and I try to make this during this presentation, I make this, I try to make this, this point during the presentation. I, I think the interproximal tissue for the most part is much, much, much more important than the free ginger margin. And I, if I, if I do, the, the socket shield technique, I really select the patients and I do it only once in a while. And as a routine procedure, I'm not so sure if that's really what, what makes a big difference. But th this is my personal approach at this point. Okay. Given the unique position of the maxillary and mandibular canines in the arch and the stresses they incur in lateral disclusion, would you elaborate on the extra strain that canine implants might experience when attached to an anterior bridge or supporting a partial denture framework? So essentially talking about, is it is it safe to place an implant to replace a, a canine? Is that sort of the question? Uh, yes, and I think so, and including that in a, a fixed denture prosthesis or a, a, an abutment to support. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think if you can avoid it, it's probably better, but if you have teeth missing, I, I, I still think putting an implant where it should be and where it provides the best support is still a better option than not doing anything. So of course, I think it carries a higher risk and there will be not necessarily for the osse integration. I don't really think that an, a canine implant is at a higher risk to lose osse integration because of being in an area that receives a lot of stress, but it's definitely a much higher risk for the components, for the screws, for the abutments, for the crowns. Because of course, as you know, an implant, there's no give on an implant crown. So I would, I would argue that there's a higher risk for the restorative componentry, and it probably requires much more occlusal refinement and probably much more follow-up and readjustments of the, of the occlusion, maybe even a, a night guard. But in terms of osseointegration, integration, I don't think it will have a negative impact. And then on the other hand, well, if you need an implant in this area, you would you would place it, right? I mean, I, I still think implants are a good option in situations where you have no teeth. Uh, should orthodontic extrusion be stopped once at the bone level of adjacent teeth or do you recommend overcorrection? Well, I think as I showed in this one case here, I think this, this case I showed and it was the third to last or so, right at the end of this presentation, it was really, really over extruded. And even if you over extrude, and I tried to show this with, this with the radiographs, the bone in between those teeth, once both teeth, and there was teeth number nine and 10, once both teeth were removed, the bone pretty much levels out. So if you do the over extrusion to get better bone levels in between two teeth that are missing. So in the area, let's say nine and 10, the over extrusion pro probably does not give you any benefits. Now the over extrusion does help for the buccal bone. So if you extrude a tooth and you over extrude it, you pretty much bring all the bone coronal to a point where no socket is left. However, in those cases, the vector, the vector, the, the orthodontist, or if you do it yourself, the way you extrude the tooth is really, really critical because if you do it not in the right way, you can actually 
you can actually lose bone. You can actually have more of a recession when the tooth is removed. So the over extrusion for interproximal tissue, yeah, I would agree is probably, yeah, as I showed on this one case, is probably not necessary. So all you need to do is you have to bring the bone coronal in between two teeth so it's level with the adjacent teeth. And then again, if you can keep, and for the most part, it would be a lateral incisor. If you can keep it, keep it, because then the tissue would be anchored to the tooth and would be held in position and would not resorb or shrink back after the tooth is extracted. All righty. Uh, in one of the asymmetry cases, could you please explain more about the steps and rationale? You mentioned that you placed an implant first to support the papilla and then placed an, another implant 10 weeks later. Oh, perfect. Let, let me show this, go to this case here. I think um, we are talking about this case here. So, so this was essentially more like a flat gingival architecture case. And when you look at the radiographs on the right side, number nine and number 10, they're really close together. So it's quite a bit of a root proximity. Mm -hmm. And the sequential approach in a case like this, if you really think that you need two implants for whatever reason, but you say, okay, I really want to do two implants in this. I really think, let me go back again. If you took both teeth out, and placed both implants at the same time. That's a lot of trauma to the little bit of bone in between those two implants. So let's assume you take out number nine and number 10. What, what you do by removing both teeth, you take away pretty much the blood supply for this little bit of bone, peak of bone in between those two teeth. Because they, the, the bone in this area is a tooth dependent structure and it gets nourished via blood vessels from the parent ligament. And if you remove those two teeth at the same time, I think there's a little bit too much deprivement of vascularization. And so a better way would be you take one tooth out first, restore it with a provisional even, and allow the bone to really fill in and heal and gets revascularized. And now you take the second implant, you take the second tooth out and place the implant to allow for the bone to stay more or less where, where it was before you removed the teeth. And so eventually, as you see on the right side, you are able to preserve the bone a little bit better rather than removing both teeth at the same time. Now, if there's a lot of room, a lot of space, like on all of those central incisor cases, I don't think it makes a difference. But in those cases where you end up with those implants a little bit close to one another, I think a sequential approach might be beneficial. Uh, what do you use to polish the composite of custom healing abutments? Does it need to be highly polished? I don't think so. I really don't think that it needs to be highly polished. You have your regular composite, make sure it's perfectly cured, and then just use your, your discs or use some, you know, um, rubber tips. I, I don't think you need to have a glaze on it. I, I'm not even sure. I, I did for some time, times I used a glaze over it to make it even less, you know, less porosities. But I don't, I don't think it's really necessary. I think maybe a little bit of porosities might be even, you know, fine and definitely not detrimental. Just make sure it has a nice, um, nice contours, it's, it's cured. And I typically, when it's all done, I put it in a little bit of um, alcohol to make sure there all the inhibition zone is removed. Mm -hmm. And then I use a little bit of a um, antibiotic cream to kind of apply it around it before you put it in and on the implant. That's what I typically use, but I don't spend, you know, hours on, on polishing the, the custom healing abutment. I think uh, this is a good question uh, here. How do you create shape uh, with your provisional when the tempor temporary material is too soft to displace and shape the gingiva? So you know what they're getting at there, right? I mean, the temporary material is too soft? Yes. Like using? Like the flowable or one of the Lux attempts. I, and I, I, you didn't have this in your presentation today, but I've seen it before. You, you're, you're taking that, you're picking up that provisional in the mouth 
and then you're adding to it outside the absolutely mother. yes yeah. yes absolutely yeah, so so oh so i understand no 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 yeah. so very good point no you don't yeah very good points you don't want to use flowable composite in the mouth to displace the tissue so let's say for some reason the tissue is too coronal and you want to displace the tissue apically you start in the mouth but then exactly right you take it out and you add to it outside the mouth and then you try it in again and keep adding but yeah you cannot use any of those materials in the mouth. And that's where I said it, it, it takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of imagination to kind of get the shape right. Yeah, but you can't, the flowable composite or Luxatemp or any of those materials, they cannot really be used inside the mouth and pushed against the tissue. It's always, you, you do it inside the mouth and then remove it from the mouth and add to it outside and then put it back in and see if this is now the right amount of pressure. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. So and that's, uh, you're not using the flowable composite in the mouth. Uh, because a person asked here, how did stop flowable composite from going down the socket prior to placing bone graft? And so, right. Yeah. So you use it only for the outline. Now I have a video on it, but I would probably not be able to find it. But if you yeah, want yeah. me to, I could, <laughs> let's, but it might let's mess not up go everything. down that rabbit hole. Uh, if you, <laughs> We can share. <laughs> okay. Any recommendations on good anterior implant aesthetic courses for more detail on this subject? Hmm. That's a good point. I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, again, you can always contact me on this um, email address if you were come to the office or, you know, talk to me absolutely anytime. I don't know. Tim, do you know any? Well, you know, the Washington Academy in general dentistry, we've got some great courses that are coming up. And it, it, let's face yeah. it, John Coyce, Frank Spear, uh, they're putting out great courses. The, the Panky people, I, I would go with the, 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 the tried and true uh, institutes if I was uh, right. you know, really focused on those things. Yeah, that's a good so, point. And, and, and I know there's lots out there. Those ones just come to mind. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, we're winding down on questions here. Uh, uh, oh, did you have your email address there? Uh, did you share that? At the yeah, end? let me put it up again. I think I had it way yeah, in the Yeah, we, we got it. Yeah. yeah, somebody asked for that. Uh, well, yeah, so again, if someone wants to contact me anytime, please. Thank no you. problem. Uh, okay, is it true that using zirconia implants is better for patients with bruxism? Boy, oh boy, I don't, <laughs> I I don't know. know. I would argue maybe the opposite, but yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it helps with uh, bruxism. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I cannot really comment much on zirconia or, cer or ceramic implants. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, again, if you, if you look at, you know, long-term stability and what's out there, I, I think titanium implants are still the implants with the longest track record. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there are, there are also problems with, with titanium implants. It's not like you put an implant in and you're good to go for the rest of the life. But um, I think with zirconia implants or ceramic implants, it's, it's even much more of an unknown. And we certainly don't have those 20, 15, 25 years of, of long-term follow-up on those. So I, I, again, I cannot comment too much on zirconia or ceramic implants. Sorry. All righty. Uh, you know, I'm going to, the, the questions keep coming in here. I'm going to stop at the questions I have remaining in my queue here. So please don't add any more. Um, how do you transfer soft tissue information when using digital scanning impressions? And I know this isn't really your wheelhouse. Yes, but that's a little bit more tricky. I think it really so is that's I think where the digital impression techniques do are a little bit yeah uh, a little bit of an issue and I think a lot of people who used it there are in in some cases where it's, where really aesthetics matter a lot they're going back and using just regular impression techniques because it's a little bit more tricky to kind of get this all sorted out with digital impressions how much torque do you apply counterclockwise when you torque test your implants at the impression appointment? So when I do the torque testing at the impression appointment, I typically use five Newton centimeters higher than 
the insertion torque for the restoration. So let's say if it's a Stroman implant, I would typically use 40 Newton centimeters. If it's like a um, 3.0 Noble active implant, I would use only 20 Newton centimeters. So there's no number you can use across the board. You have to be specific on what implant system you're working. And it, if you do, let's say you say, oh, I use 45 Newton centimeters across the board, and then you you face an implant like a three millimeter Noble Active or a small Astra implant, and you do this, you pretty much break and destroy the entire implant. So it's safe to say that the um, counter torque test should be a little bit higher than the insertion torque you would employ and we'd imply on the, on the final implant supported restoration. That's a good you know, guideline there. Uh, what books do you recommend? For implants? Yes, um, <laughs> that's what I'm assuming. <laughs> I uh, hope it's not the big hungry caterpillar or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Tim, do you have any books oh, you would recommend? I don't know. I, I'm trying to think. Uh, you, you know, uh, just some of the classics. Mish's textbook is a great place for most to start. And uh, boy, I don't know. I haven't bought an implant textbook in years. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think if you want to start out with this, as, as Tim said, I mean, it's probably best to really, you know, take a few of those courses or, you know, contact people that, that have done a few of those cases already. But if you're more into this, if you're already, you know, restoring implants, placing implants, uh, just not looking at sort of the, the final, whatever, 5%, I think rather than trying to find a textbook, is just go and look at the articles. Just go on PubMed and see what you're interested in and then find the articles and then try to, you know, pull those articles and, and read through those articles. And again, I mean, if I don't get like 850 emails tomorrow and you are requesting a few articles and say, hey, what's a good article? Or I've seen this article, but I cannot get it. I typically have access to all of the PDFs. And if you need one here and there, I can, I can send you a few if you need to. But I think this would be for one who has a little bit more experience already and then says, okay, so now where do I take it from here? So where do I find good information on how to to X, Y, and Z. And I think, you know, articles and sometimes even review articles are also a good, you know, point yeah. uh, to start. And I would suggest if uh, people are really getting into implants, they attend the Academy Osseo Integration meeting or they at attend the Perio meeting because that's, you're, you're really going to get exposed to uh, the scientific literature boiled down there if you pick the right speakers to go see. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, this is a periodontist trying to steal what you're doing. Dr. Catafucci asks, do you see any difference using Thai temporary abutments versus peak temporary abutments for making a custom abutment or provisional? I, I didn't get the first one. Using high what? A ti 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 titanium. Oh, oh titanium. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I, I would say I would say for custom healing abutments, temporaries, I would always use metal abutments. I would not use any peak. I would not use any plastic abutments. It seems like the they are more they're sturdier. They are a little bit better long term. And I, the one picture I showed was a a plastic abutment, if you will. But I would not use plastic abutments at at this stage anymore. I would just use you know, metal abutments and then add the composite to it or add the, the crown to it. Yeah, I would, not, I would not use plastic or peak or any of those yeah. softer materials anymore. Yeah. Okay, do you recommend upper or lower night guards or both or hard night guards uh, or hard soft night guards? Well, that's a good question. So I think between hard and soft night guards, it depends what you're using it for. If you use it just for, for TMD, and I'm not an expert at this at all, but if you use it for TMD, it seems to be that it doesn't really matter. And the soft night guards might be a little bit more you know, easier to wear. But if you use it to protect, and again, not to protect your implants, but to protect your restorations, a hard night guard might be better. Now, I, I still think a maxillary night guard is better to use, but then sometimes if patients want to use it almost like 24 seven, it might be easier for them to have a lower night guard because it's not as aesthetically, you know, 
evident. What I think is important though on night guards, which is sometimes overlooked a little bit, let's say if you use a night guard because you think the patient is a bruxer or has some parafunctions, I think it's important to recheck the night guard at least after three months and then really see if there's any wear, any tear, any streaks on the night guard. Because if not, then it's two options, right? One, it's either the patient's not wearing the night guard at all, or the second possibility might be that the patient might not need it because the patient is not a Bruxer, is not exhibiting any parafunctions. But long story short, I think if you want to do a night guard and you want to protect your restorations and the, the joints, the screws, the abutments on implants, um, I would prefer a Maxeter night guard as my first choice, lower night guard, second. And both should be, if you do them, I, I think they should be hard acrylic. Uh, do you use PRP? Um, also on PRP, the last one I used was you know, 2003. So that was the, I, I think one of the first um, machines. We had it at the University of Washington. We're using it in those days. I, and, and again, I, I don't know if you know, I should get too much into detail, but but I think a PRP is probably not giving you a lot of extra benefits, at least in the periodontal field. I don't see that the tissue is healing faster or you get more tissue um, aesthetics or you get more bone growth or any of this when you're using PRP. However, it does increase the cost of the procedures and, well, I shouldn't say morbidity, but it, it makes the procedure a little longer and there's, you know, I have to draw blood and you have to do a little bit extra steps for it. So I'm, I'm not using it for any of those procedures. And I think I, I'm hard pressed to, to say that it makes a difference. So I, I think I would challenge everyone who shows cases with PRP and argue that the same result could have been achieved without using PRP. That, that's at least my, my opinion, my approach. Um. This is a question that says sticky bone instead of connective tissue graft. Uh, I'm not sure what sticky bone is. Uh, are you familiar with that? Term? Well, I don't know if, he, if he's referring to more like a putty or more like a bone that can be molded and, and held. Oh, okay. Um, the, the position where you put it at. I, I personally think, and, and this doesn't really matter what sort of bone you're using, or even if you screw a block way above um, the crest of bone, any of this, any, any time you augment or you build out tissue beyond its you know, envelope of, of function, if you will, before, be, be, beyond its alveolar housing, it will eventually shrink back. I think there's a genetic plan, there's a genetic master plan for the bone to be it. And even if you add bone and graft it and over extrude and do socket grafts and, and guided bone regeneration. When everything is done and settled in, I think this is really the final, um, these are the final limitations. And the one participant said, said it earlier, I think, where he was saying that the over extrusion or the over building really in the long term or even medium term probably doesn't make a big difference. So any sort of bone, any sort of graftings that's been employed will eventually still have to obey to biological principles, I think. Uh, what is the earliest time to place a custom provisional after immediate implant placement? Yeah, so I would, I would say, depending on the um, insertion torque, if you have good stability and you, if you have you know, the implant being surrounded almost like 270 degrees by bone, so mesodistal and palatal, you can probably go ahead and start six weeks five to six weeks even after the implant is placed. If you put an implant in and you have rotational instability, you just put the implant in and you're not quite sure if this is even integrating, I would probably give it a full three and a half months. But with good insertion torque and radiographically, you can see if there's good contact, even though you cannot obviously radiographically assess the bone to implant contact, but you can still see radiographically if the implant is an intimate contact with the surrounding bone, you have good insertion torque, you can start with within you know five six weeks after the implant is placed. Okay, thoughts about cantilevering a lateral off a central incisor implant? Yeah, I, I would say 
that is absolutely an option, especially in situations where the tight is, where the space is tight. I would though, if that's treatment plan, I would put a, a two-unit implant supported restoration that's school retained. So you don't have to, you know, then you have no issues with cementing the crown. You don't have any issues with cement loosening or getting any sort of um, restorative complications. So in this situation, I think it's really, really important to have a two unit implant supported restoration, but it should be screw retained in the, in the uh, central incisor site. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take you to create a custom impression coping and what is patient wearing while you're doing that to prevent tissue from collapsing? Yeah, so if you have your pixie cup pre-prepared, so you have your lab analogs mounted, it, it really doesn't take long. You take the um, provisionals out, you mount it on the pixie cup, you squirt your PVS around it, and that's it. And then you put the provisionals back on. So it, is, it, it, it takes the amount of time your PVS takes to set. And the tissue, I, I know that's always been discussed and talked about that the tissue will sort of shrink and collapse right away, but that's not a big problem because you put the provisional back in and then you have the tish, tissue you know, back to where it was before. Now, if you leave it for like two or three hours or even put um, healing abutments back on and let the patient go home, well, that's a different story. Then you have to start developing the tissue. But again, if you use a fast setting PVS, it should take no longer than three, four minutes. And there's no really problem with the tissue, tissue slumping or collapsing in, in those three to four minutes. Okay, last question. Is flat okay. gingival biotype the same as thick gingival biotype? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That is a very good question. And most people would say, yes, it's the same. So they always combine the thin scalloped and the flat thick. But I don't think it's necessarily the case. You can have always a combination of both. And you can sometimes even have a thick biotype and not much bone underneath. So I think there are all kinds of variations. What I was trying to show or say is that if it's flat and you don't have those scalloped papillaries, you're much better off um, aesthetically. Now, you could argue that for the most part, a flat is also thick but I would say not necessarily all the time. So that's why I think from an aesthetic point of view, it's more important to focus on the flatness and the scallopedness versus the thickness and the thinness. But yeah, that would be a short answer to this. All right, Dr. Schuler, we got you through over 50 questions there. I really so much. appreciate you spending the time. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. We're very fortunate to have you in this area and at the University of Washington. Um, so just a reminder, uh, CE credit will uh, be emailed to you in the next uh, day or so. Uh, AGD members, we will add that to your uh, AGD. Uh, we'll send it into the AGD and it'll appear on your transcript in probably two to four weeks. Uh, there was a question, uh, since this was a one hour CE event uh, and we went longer, will there be extra CE credit? I do not know the answer to that. We will take a look at it. Uh, but again, uh, thank you to Dr. Schuler, and we invite every one of you to uh, visit our webpage at washingtonagd.org to check out the great uh, webinars that we have tomorrow, Friday, and for the next three weeks. So with that, WAGD is saying stay home, stay healthy, and please enjoy our CE. Thank, thank you. you.